sugar. Who doesn't like sugar in the audience? I think if you, if you uh, don't like sugar, I think you're lying to yourself. And why do we like sugar? Because sugar gives us energy. And you know, when you think about where does sugar come from and what sugar really is, to me, sugar is the energy of the sun captured there for us to use. And it comes from plants. Plants are the only, uh, we can synthesize sugars, but we have to start from something that comes from plants. And how do plants get it? They get it through a process called photosynthesis, which I think is really the first or maybe the second wonder of the world, that they can, um, that they can capture the energy of the sun in a way that they can store and use for other things. And it's a complicated process, but basically to boil it down, what it comes down to is they're taking water from the ground and carbon dioxide from the air and using the energy of sunlight to mash those molecules together and squeeze out a little oxygen. And what you're left are these carbon, hydrogen, oxygen chains, which is basically sugar. And they use that for everything they need to do. Uh, when you look at plants growing you know, in a garden or in, in the wild, you're not thinking about this process of photosynthesis and what's happening. But behind the scenes, they're taking that sugar and they're using it for a whole array of, come on, baby, there we go, a whole array of different things that they need to grow and to survive and to bloom and to reproduce. Uh, I, I think of my job as a horticulturalist as really a manager in the photosynthesis factory, right? And you know, when I'm out in the garden, what I'm doing is trying to get plants to grow uh, their best so that they can bloom, they can produce more flowers, more fruits, etc. This is a picture of uh, a wild iris in the woods on the left. And then when you bring it out into the garden where you're giving it more water and fertilizer and it's flowering more. So it makes sense that you're helping that plant to photosynthesize more, to make more of that sugar that it can use to produce more flowers. And that's sort of the essence of, of gardening in a way. You can see that with trees. If you've ever looked at tree rings, when conditions are good during a year, that, that tree produces more wood than it does in a year when uh, conditions aren't so good. The red line, not so good. The green line, a better year, so it grew more. Uh, if you've uh, growing vegetables, you know that you, you do a good job growing your tomatoes, you're going to get a lot more fruit. It's very tangible. We don't think necessarily about what happens uh, below ground, but that's important too. You know, really the half the plant is roots that, that are underground that we can't see, but really in some ways probably the most important part of that plant, but through photosynthesis that plant is growing roots. I like this graphic because it sort of gives you the idea that here's a tree and we see the above ground part of the tree, but underground is just as compl complex a branching pattern, uh, a structure pattern that that plant needs to grow. And those roots that you see there, if there was soil around them, obviously they'd be anchoring that tree to the ground, preventing it from blowing over. Uh, but roots function uh, in other important ways too. They're really the, the, uh, the connection uh, to a whole biological community underground that the tree depends on to survive. Uh, what you see there are kind of the structural roots, but if you go um, and look in detail at roots, what you see are these little furry structures on those root tips. All these tiny little roots that are growing and dying underground are connecting with the soil around them. And those little root hairs, as they're called, are absorbing nutrients, water, from the soil that's carried up into the plant, into the leaves, and allows that plant to grow and photosynthesize, and then it flows, that energy flows back down into the roots again. So there's a sort of upward and downward flow that's going on. And so the more connection that that root system has with the soil, the better it can utilize those resources, and photosynthesis works better, and everything works better. So it's really sort of a neurological connection with the soil in a, a metaphorical way. But plants early on, when they made the leap from the water onto land, figured out that they could do a much better job if they partnered with other organisms underground to create a much more uh, intricate connection with that living community. And that's really the, the, the essence of symbiosis, of you know, a mutualistic relationship where both parties get something out of the relationship. And what you notice when you study plants, that when they have this carbohydrate budget, the sugar budget, which is essentially what this is, 
where are they putting those resources? They're putting a lot of resources to the symbiotic relationships underground. Have you heard of mycorrhizae before? Mycorrhizae is, it, uh, uh, mycorrhizal roots are an interesting fusion of a fungus and a plant. And so this is a picture of, you can see the kind of the yellow there. That's the, that's the pine seedlings roots. And the, all the white that you see there are the, the, basically the fungal roots of this mycorrhizal fungus that is fused with the pine and created this incredible surface area. You can see why I think of it as a neurological connection with the soil. It created all that surface area to absorb nutrients for the plant. Uh, I, I took this picture out in my backyard, and this is a, a, a white pine root going down uh, through the picture there and branching off. And you can see all the white splotches there. Those are the, the hyphae, the, the roots, so to speak, of the fungus it's partnered with. Now, they're growing around the root of that pine, and as they digest that wood that you see them growing on, they're absorbing nutrients out of there and feeding it into the tree. And in return, the tree is taking some of that sugar that it's making through photosynthesis and leaching it out and feeding the fungus. So the fungus is doing things the tree can't do, and the tree is doing things that the fungus can't do. Because when you think about it, you know, that, what that tree is doing is digesting its dead self. Things that have sloughed off and fell down to the ground have gone into the soil, and it needs to recapture those nutrients to, uh, to be able to grow again. Plants don't have internal stomachs. You know, basically, the soil is their stomach. And it's something that I've kind of you know, thought about through the years, this concept of, of the soil as the stomach for the plants, and the soil is this living community that we need to uh, view that way. Because the reality is in the, in the 20th century and now in, in the 21st century, we see soil as just, you know, you track it across the carpet, it gets under your fingernails. If you grow plants, you know it's the stuff that you got to plant the plants in. But we don't think about it as an ecosystem. Uh, and the green revolution that triggered this, you know, huge advances in agriculture in the 20th century that allow us to feed this growing population of the world uh, was done through the, 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 how we figured out how to take uh, petroleum products and create fertilizer that plants can use to grow. And so we put these chemical fertilizers on the soil and the plants grow, but basically it kills off over time the natural community in the soil, the natural ecosystem in the soil, because we're not really feeding the soil stomach. It's basically like sticking an intravenous needle in your arm and thinking, I can live this way for the rest of my life with a drip bag of glucose syrup going into your arm. So one of the best things that I can uh, suggest you do if you're interested in, uh, in plants, and especially growing plants, is think about the soil, think about feeding the soil. We do it through adding compost, which is partially digested food to feed the soil system. We spread it on this time of year. We're going out um, and you know, spreading the compost on the ground. And you can see the effect that it's having. If you, if you look at that, that picture on the left there, that's a sort of sterile, dead soil, the kind of soil that you get if you just add chemical fertilizers to it over years. Uh, it, the roots can't get through it. It's very compacted. There's no life in that soil. And the middle picture is a soil that I've just put compost on the surface of it. And over a couple of years, as that breaks down, the organisms in that soil uh, create chemicals that break that soil up. So even, the, uh, even without mixing it in, it's become more friable. The roots can penetrate more deeply into the soil, and the soil comes alive again. So fortunately, it's very easy to sort of you know, reinvigorate uh, a dead soil. And I said compost is you know, what I like to use, but I prefer not to use bag compost because when you buy compost, you're buying dead organic material, and you're also buying this living community that's breaking down that organic material. So I like to get it you know, when it's steaming hot and uh, full of life. Because when you think about it, you know, heat means life. And so if you're using this material that's warm like that, that means it's living, and you put it on the ground, and the results are really spectacular. Uh, and we, uh, we spread this around. You can see this is a planting at the botanical gardens. This was put in, and then just two months later, you can see the way the plants have grown using this system. Here's another picture uh, just in planting in the middle of May, and here uh, just a couple months later, how everything has really grown and filled in. People ask us, you know, how do you grow all these plants? You must use a lot of pesticides and everything to do. We don't spray anything on these plants. We just, mainly we feed the soil, we pick the right plants, and we let nature do the rest. Click. 
One of the amazing things that you learn when you study the, the soil is the amount of their carbohydrate budget, all that sugar that the plants are making that they leach out into the ground. This is the area around a root tip that you see, and you can see that kind of stippling look there. That's basically the, um, the, the rhizosphere where the plant is, is exuding sugars out to feed these organisms in the ground. And they're doing that partly be, for their own defense. Uh, the, by creating this beneficial community of life around the roots, they're actually uh, attacking problem things that are killing off the roots. So they're for providing for their own defense. Because that's you know, very important when you're a plant. You can't run away when you're a plant. You have to be thinking about you know, where am I going to survive, how am I going to survive. And so uh, plants do that through a number of means, by utilizing other organisms, by creating poisons. Uh, poisons and defensive chemicals are very important, too. Uh, a large part of their sugar budget goes into, into this. And if you look at this electron microscope picture, you see that looks like a caterpillar down there. That's a glandular hair that's filled with uh, poisons. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, study that was done on, uh, this is uh, wild tobacco. Wild tobacco plants are fed on by this uh, tomato hornworm caterpillar. When that Hornworm starts to chew the leaves, it breaks open those glandular hairs, releases a chemical into the air, and that's picked up by other tobacco plants in the area that start to build up their own defensive chemicals to prepare for the attack of the caterpillars. It also goes out into the air and is picked up by tiny little wasps that follow this chemical trail and parasitize the caterpillar and kill it. So we, we think plants can't talk, but plants communicate through chemicals. Uh, through these pheromone chemicals that they release into the air. They also you know, respond in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a similar fashion that we do to a, you know, an attack, an immune system response that plants have to things that happen to them. When that hornworm is feeding on that plant, the uh, hormone that's involved in that immune system response is salicylic acid, uh, which is basically the um, chemical in aspirin. And you can grind up aspirin and spray that on a, a, to, a tobacco plant and cause that same immune system response that you would get through feeding of the feeding of that caterpillar without the uh, deleterious effects of, uh, of the spray. Plant pigments are defensive chemicals, too. We don't really think about them in that way. Uh, these are the, the colors of leaves, the reds, the oranges, and the yellows. Uh, but they do things like prevent fungal attacks. Uh, they prevent, protect against cold. Uh, the, one of the most interesting groups of, chemi of uh, plant pigments are anthocyanins. Uh, and these are uh, what we know of as antioxidants. When we eat uh, fruits rich in antioxidants, it helps prevent, uh, uh, supposedly, you know, helps us keep us healthier again. And what's interesting is that where you find the greatest amount of antioxidants in most plants is in the fruits that are available for other things to eat. So the idea with a strawberry is that something eats that and then takes it, walks somewhere else, and then poops it out, and then the, the strawberry plants grow there. And so I think it's kind of interesting that the plant is providing this uh, in some ways to keep its seed vector healthy so that it can do its job and spread those seeds somewhere else. So think about that the next time you're eating a strawberry, what that plant wants you to do. They also prevent you know, cold damage, camouflage, and that sort of thing. But it's one, it is, we, one of the most beautiful things about plant pigments is what happens in the fall. And this is also one of the greatest enigmas, too, because when, the, when a leaf is dying and all the sugar that it's making, it can't transfer that sugar down to the roots. It's trapped in the leaf, and so that leaf just turns that sugar into these beautiful pigments. It's almost like it wants to go out in a glaze of uh, a, a blaze of glory because it has nothing else left to do. The title of this talk is Sugar, Sex, and Poison, so I had to end with a little bit of uh, sex in the end. Fortunately, sex in plants is very G-rated. Uh, flowers, uh, everything happens behind the, you know, the veil of the flower, but basically the, the colorful flowers that you see are designed to attract pollinators, as we learned about from Danielle's talk, that come and take pollen the yellow substance in that picture, and move it to the next flower and unite it with an unfertilized egg, and you get uh, baby plants out of it. You know. But the problem is pollen's very expensive to produce. It takes a lot of sugar to make pollen. So what 
a lot of plants have figured out how to do is to trick insects uh, with something a little less expensive, and that's basically sugar water or nectar. So flowers are structured in a way to fool the insects so that they avoid the pollen for the most part and go for this cheap uh, sugar reward. I think if you ask flowers about insects, they'd probably say they're, so, you know, they're a lot of stupid jokes because <laughs> they, uh, they're able to get away with uh, providing this little reward to do all that free service that Danielle was talking about. Here you've got that sort of a honey-colored background to that flower. The bee sees that goes in, goes right past the pollen and pollinates that flower. Uh, hummingbirds, uh, as they go in to feed on this uh, cardinal flower, are getting dabbed on the forehead with pollen where they can't reach it. Uh, this flower, the butterfly, is getting dusted on its belly with pollen as it's going for the nectar. Um, so the structure of these things is designed very effectively to fool the insect or, you know, or the bird to do the plant's bidding. This is a jack, I mean, this is a skunk cabbage which grows in the woods around here. It produces a rotting, fetid insect smell. And so uh, flies come into this and they lay their eggs inside the flower and pollinate it. But of course, the eggs don't do anything. Uh, the flies die. There are other plants that are even more insidious. This one, it looks like the inside of a nice, furry, dead mammal and smells that way too. This one looks like it already has fly eggs all over it, so the flies think this must be a good spot and they lay their eggs on there. And so they're pollinating the plant, but of course, their own reproduction has come to a halt. Another one that I like is a, this is a wildflower that grows in the Midwestern prairies, a blazing star. And this releases the sex pheromone of monarch butterflies. And so if you grow this plant, every monarch in the neighborhood will come and feed on this plant as it's drawn in by that sex pheromone and then pollinate the plant uh, in the meantime. You know, sex is a very powerful motivator even for uh, insects, and, and some plants are uh, very effective at using it uh, in that way. Uh, we, we learned about bumblebees a little bit earlier. Um, in Europe, there's a species of orchid called the uh, bee orchids, or ophrys, and they're designed to mimic both the look and the smell of a female bee. And male bees see this flower, and they mate with the flower. And uh, all they get for their effort is basically the, uh, a little sack of pollen dabbed on the back of their abdomen. And so then, you know, being stupid insects, as the, plant, as the flowers would say, they would go and they'll mate with another one, pollinate that plant, uh, and then mate with another one, but they never actually get to mate with a real bee. So powerful is that pheromone that that orchid produces. Oh, baby. Once that pollen is transferred to the next flower to the, uh, and, you know, and as it lands on the right surface, there we go. Um, that pollen actually sprouts a long tube which grows down, 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 deep into the flower, into the hidden recesses of that flower, finds an unfertilized egg, and then squirts its DNA into that egg. And then a seed starts to grow and starts this whole process over. So you have the next generation. So I, I hope when you, when you go walking around in the woods, when you go walking around in a garden, uh, and you're looking at beautiful flowers, think a little bit about the magic of photosynthesis and what, uh, what not only this does for plants, but it does for everything else in the world. We really would not be here if it weren't for plants and if it wasn't for photosynthesis. So I thank you very much.